Let's continue our study of 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to cover the last few verses, verses 14 through 16. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, 14 through 16 will be our text this morning. And we pick up reading in verse 14, where Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Well, let's pray and we'll ask God to help us to understand these words this morning. Father, as always, we are in need of your Holy Spirit to open up our eyes and our ears and our understanding so that we might get the full gist of what Paul wrote to Timothy here. Teach us, dear Spirit, the Word of God this morning. May we listen for your honor and glory. May it change our lives, building us up in the most holy faith. And if there are lost people who hear the Word of God this morning, use your Word to awaken them to salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Truth isn't what it used to be, folks. Sometimes it may even be a falsehood. During one of the White House scandals, a famous lawyer was asked if his client was telling the truth. Tell us the truth, he demanded. And the lawyer answered, the truth is what is in the deposition unless we make a deal with the prosecutor or say something else. In other words, the truth is something that may or may not be actually true. And this is something to be manipulated, the truth is, for our own personal advantage. I know in pulpits this morning, truth will not be spoken in order to manipulate the people to do something, give more money or whatever they're trying to do, and they manipulate the truth to get people to do what they want them to do, whether it's truth or not. Sadly, lawyers and politicians are not the only ones who don't know the difference between truth and falsehood. Churches today are very weak because they've exchanged the feelings of our modern culture for the truth of Christ. And if that's true, then churches are no longer churches. They can call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, but they're not churches. In the process of explaining his purpose for writing to Timothy, the Apostle Paul defines the church by its relationship to the truth. As we just read in verses 14 and 15, these things I write unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly, but... If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth, is what Paul wrote. Paul was planning on visiting Ephesus very shortly, uh, but in case he was providentially hindered, maybe he would get arrested again, maybe another shipwreck. He wanted Timothy to know how to carry out his duties as a pastor in the meantime. Since Timothy was a public letter, it seems that he also wanted to remind the Ephesian congregation there to support their pastor by behaving themselves in the household of God. And from what we've seen thus far in 1 Timothy, here's the kind of conduct that Paul had in mind. He wanted them to have sound doctrine, we learned in verses 1 through 20. He wanted to have proper gender, gender, uh, gender relationships, we learned in chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. And he wanted them to have proper spiritual leadership, proper elders, and proper deacons that we looked at in chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. 
This is what he wanted them in the church. This is how he wanted them to behave. Now, it's not known exactly how this letter fits in Paul's root in the book of Acts, nor can we know uh, for sure if his travels even brought him back to Ephesus in the, uh, if he ever got back there. But in the providence of God, because Paul was uncertain, he was led to write this letter, and the Holy Spirit has used it ever since to tell Christians all over the world how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now, household is a picture that comes up repeatedly in 1 Timothy and really throughout the New Testament. The members of the true church are sons and daughters of God the Father. And having been born again through faith in God's Son, we have been adopted into his family by the Holy Spirit. And so we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Each and every one of us has a place of fellowship and service in God's household. Second, the church is God's residence, what Paul calls the church of the living God there in verse 15. In other words, the church is not simply God's household, it's also his house. John Calvin wrote, there's good reason why God should call the church his house. For not only has he received us as his sons and by the grace of adoption, but he himself dwells in the midst of us as he's doing this very morning. Here Paul may have been reminding the Ephesians what he told them in an earlier letter when he spoke about the church in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. There in Ephesians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 22. The church is the house that God built. Now the promise that God makes his home in the church must have been especially encouraging to the Ephesians who worshiped in the shadow of that temple of the goddess Diana that we've mentioned several times in these, in, this, in these sermons. Diana's temple in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And they saw this thing every day. Uh, but however impressive it seemed from the outside, it had no life whatsoever. The goddess in the temple was nothing more than a dead idol. In contrast, Paul wanted to remind the Ephesians that the church of Jesus Christ is the real temple. The living God does not dwell in temples built by human hands. He lives among his people, especially during their public worship. Whenever Christians gather for prayer and praise, for the word, for the ordinances, God takes up residence, and there he is in their midst. God is in the house. And I hope you believe that this morning. God is in the house. This is why Christian worship begins with a prayer of invocation. In the opening prayer, a church invites the Holy Spirit to enter into the house of worship with power. And if a church is true to God's word, the Spirit will always make his presence known as we intend to see him make his presence known even here in the midst of our small congregation. Whenever visitors enter a church where the Spirit of God is present with the people of God in worship, they will say, surely God is in this place. And I've heard that before. The Spirit was in this place. Church is not only home for God and for his people, it's also a home for the truth. Paul continues his picture of the church with a third definition of the church, and it is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Verse 15. Now, Roman Catholic scholars often use this very verse to argue against the Reformation doctrine of solo scriptura. They say that the church is the foundation for the truth, and therefore scripture is not the only rule for faith and practice, as the reformers taught and that Baptists have always taught. We have to obey the church traditions, they say, and not the other way around. 
One huge problem with the Catholic view is that they forget Paul's free previous letter to the Ephesians. He wrote in Ephesians 2, verse 20, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The ultimate bedrock foundation of the church is the word of God spoken by the prophets of the Old Testament, written by the apostles of the New Testament, and made in flesh by God's own Son, the living word. How can the church be the foundation of the truth if the truth is the foundation of the church? I want you to notice also that one of the words Paul used to describe the church in verse 15 is the word ground, the Greek word hedroyoma, and it's a stay, it's a prop, it's a support. A ground slash support is not a building's foundation, but part of the supported structure. To be specific, a ground helps to stabilize the walls and the pillars of a large building. And in the same way, the Church of Jesus Christ helps to hold steady the truth of God's Word. The people of God are people of the truth in opposition to every other form of false teaching. They, we, support truth in the world. That's what we're here for. The other word Paul used to describe the relationship between the church and the truth is the word pillar, stulos in the Greek. And the function of the pillar is well known. The pillar holds up the roof. So to say that the church is the pillar and the ground of truth is to say that it lifts up the truth for the whole world to see. John Stott, a famous pastor in England, says, the purpose of pillars is not only to hold the roof firm, but to thrust it high so that it can be clearly seen even from a distance. Just so the church holds the truth aloft so that it is seen and admired by the world. Indeed, as pillars lift a building high while remaining themselves unseen, so the church's function is not to advertise itself, but to advertise and display the truth. And so the truth that the church is a pillar of truth is not so much a doctrinal truth, but a very practical truth. As, the, as opposed to the Roman Catholic view that the church determines the truth, the Bible teaches that the church displays the truth. Every Christian congregation is one pillar of truth. And the Ephesians were reminded of this every time they woke up in the morning and they look and they saw that temple of Diana, which had over 100 columns in all, and each of those columns, each of those pillars was six story high. And Paul said, no, you, you little flock that's gathering there in Ephesus, you are the pillar and the ground of truth. Why did that temple need so many pillars? Because it had a marble roof that had, to hold, and it had to be held up. Without those pillars, the temple would collapse rather than remaining visible for miles and miles. In the same way, every true church is a pillar that helps bolster the truth of Jesus Christ, holding him up for the entire world to see. And that's our job as a church for Stills Baptist Church. Now, if the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, and it is, it needs to know what the truth is. And the truth is a great mystery. Paul went on to write in verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, we talked about this when we talked about deacons and pastors. When the Bible uses the word mystery, it's not referring to something that needs to be solved, but something that was long hidden and is now revealed. In the Bible, a mystery is the secret plan of salvation, which is no longer a secret, 
because God has revealed it to us. The mysteries concerning Jesus Christ are deep. They are great. Megas is the Greek word. Things that are esteemed highly for their importance. A great moment of great weight, importance, as per Strong's, where there are many definitions for the word mega. The greatness of the mysteries of the gospel is demonstrated by the fact that they are without controversy. There's no doubt about it. No controversy here. Great are the mysteries of godliness. The mystery of the gospel are great by common agreement. No one's doubting this. Almost certainly this was another attack on the goddess Diana. During Paul's first visit to Ephesus, the silversmiths, you recall, threatened his missionary work and they put the whole city in an uproar. As many as 20,000 people crowded into the theater at Ephesus were all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians for two hours! Acts 19.34 tells us. They shouted this so long and loud that their words were probably still ringing in Paul's ears when he wrote this letter. Paul knew the meaning of true greatness, however, and so he wrote, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. His very words help to convey the glory and the grandeur of the gospel. For the mystery is Jesus Christ himself. He's the mystery of godliness. This is the truth that churches are called to uphold before the world. The saving mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this mystery of Jesus Christ is described in six lines that sound like part of an early creed, maybe a catechism, maybe a confession. But because the lines are kind of rhythmic and because their first words tend to rhyme, it's often thought that this verse was part of an early Christian hymn that they sang. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. They sang... God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. These lines, they deserve a very careful study, especially since scholars disagree about how they should be divided. One suggestion is that this song should be divided into two stanzas, each three lines long. The first stanza refers to Christ's earthly ministry. He was manifested, justified, and seen, while the second stanza deals with the work of Jesus after his ascension. He was preached, he was believed on, and received up. Other scholars point out that the lines come in pairs. In each case, there's a contrast between earth and heaven, flesh, spirit, angels, Gentiles, world, glory. Since it's not certain how to divide this song, maybe the best thing to do is just not try to, to try. Divide it up. This hymn, even if it is a hymn, and I think it is, it, it's a short history of Jesus Christ. It contains the gospel truth about his work of salvation in outline form, each line is describing a different period or event in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And therefore, to me, it seems the best thing to do is to look at these verses in chronological order. See if you agree with me. First, he appeared in a body. Paul begins to say, great is the mystery of godliness. First, God, Jesus Christ, was manifest in the flesh. God in the person of Jesus was seen in a physical form. God the Son had lived in all the splendor of his, de of his deity from eternity past. There was never a time that Jesus didn't exist. Then, in the due course of time, he became a man, identical to us in his physical body. 
This is the mystery of the incarnation. God the Son becomes the God-man. And by taking upon himself human flesh and blood, he became the one person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, the only being that's ever had that. Since God the Son appeared as a man, everything he did on earth, he did as a very real human being. The events of his crucifixion were real physical events. He was kissed by his betrayer. His face was spat upon. His body was hit and slapped. His back was flogged. His head was pierced with thorns. Peter says, Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Christ even died in the flesh. It was a real body that was nailed with real nails to the cross with a real wood. It was a real body that was punished for sin. Again, Peter said, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That was a real body. It was a corpse that was taken down from the cross, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a tomb. God the Son didn't just appear in a body. The body in which he appeared was a crucified, dead, and buried body. It was real. Next, he was justified in the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit confirmed he vindicated, he proved that Jesus Christ is God's only begotten Son and the Savior of the world by raising him from the dead. When and how did the Holy Spirit prove or justify that this was really the Messiah? The Spirit proved it at Jesus' baptism when he descended on him from heaven like a dove in Matthew 3.16. He proved it by preserving Jesus from sin throughout his earthly ministry. He proved it whenever he performed miracles, especially when he drove out demons. We read in Matthew 12, 28, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. He proved it. He verified this. He justified this in all these ways, but especially through the resurrection. Resurrection Sunday is a day to praise God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead, but the resurrection was such an important event that it required all three members of the Trinity to be involved. God the Father raised God the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us, when the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, he confirmed everything that Jesus ever said, everything that he ever did was true. Although he was rejected by the world, he was approved. He was justified by the Spirit. He was justified. Justified is a, is a legal declaration. And in this case, he was declared to be the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Paul wrote elsewhere in Romans 1.4 that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness and by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection was the Holy Spirit's verification, his justification that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And so he appeared in a body, and the Spirit of God confirmed that. After he was justified in the Spirit, he was seen of angels. Let's think about angels for a moment. These powers of the unseen world, especially these glorious supernatural creatures who worship God in heaven and serve him here on earth. These are the angels. We know from the Gospels that some of the angels witnessed the first coming of Jesus. They sang about him at his birth in Luke chapter 2. They also attended to him in the wilderness, Mark tells us in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, and even appeared in the Garden of Gethsemane to strengthen Jesus for the work that he was about to do on the cross, Luke 
22, verse 33. But angels were also witnesses to the risen Christ. They were the first to tell the disciples that Jesus was alive, but how could they tell them unless they had actually seen his resurrected body for themselves? And finally, angels witnessed his ascension into heaven. And so summarizing, angels sang at his birth, they ministered in his hour of temptation, they guarded his sepulcher, they saw his ascension, and they expect his return. The reason I mention the angels here is to show that the mystery of godliness is known in heaven as well as it is on earth. And although angels themselves are never saved by grace, they glorify God for saving us. And they're doing that at this very moment, praising God for saving your and my miserable, rotten, rebellious souls. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is gone into heaven, is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. There in 1 Peter 3, 22. Now listen to what I have to say next. That there's another possible meaning for this line in Paul's hymn. Not a lot of people agree with this, but listen to this and see if it makes sense. The word angel simply means messenger. That's what it means. Which makes a great word for God's heavenly messengers. But it also could refer to his earthly messengers, the apostles. What Paul says about these messengers in verse 16 was certainly true of the apostles. They saw Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of his life and his work and especially of his resurrection. In fact, the Greek word that Paul uses here for seeing, optomahi, is the same word that he used in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, that the risen Christ was seen by Peter, Cephas, and the rest of the apostles, including himself. In fact, in order to be an apostle, you have to have seen the resurrected Christ. So when the first Christians confessed that Jesus was seen by messengers, they may have been referring to the apostles. This idea is dismissed by some, but to me it truly fits the logic of this hymn. The next thing that Jesus did after he appeared in a body and was justified or proven by the Spirit was to show himself to Peter and John and the rest of the disciples, including Doubting Thomas. Here's the sequence of Paul's hymn. First, the incarnation. Second, the resurrection. And third, the presentation. So the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus were necessary to the plan of salvation. In order for the apostles to know that Jesus was truly the Messiah, truly the Christ, they had to see his glorious resurrected body. Otherwise, they would never have been able to testify that he had won the victory over the grave. Without their eyewitness testimony, we ourselves would never believe in the resurrection, and the church of the living God would not be able to stand as the pillar and ground of the truth of the gospel. We need these apostles. The same cannot be said about angels and their testimony. We need the testimony of the apostles. The angels in heaven glorified God when they saw the resurrection, but our faith rests on Jesus revealing himself to the apostles, not to the angels. So what do you think? I, I think that's what, what's meant here, and it goes, it goes along with the hymn. Th there's another reason for thinking that angels slash messengers might refer to the apostles. Notice what comes next. Jesus was preached to the Gentiles. Gentiles, that refers to all the non-Jewish people of the world, including most of us. This clearly refers to the apostles preaching the Gospels, these angels, these messengers who have seen the risen Christ. After Christ presented his resurrected self, then came the proclamation of the Gospel to the world. The apostles received 
the commission to do this from Jesus himself. Before he ascended into heaven, he said to them, and you're familiar with these verses, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And they began to fulfill this commission at Pentecost. While they waited in Jerusalem, they were anointed by the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign tongues. And the Bible emphasizes that the people who heard them were out of every nation under heaven, there in Acts 2, 5. When Peter stood up and preached to the crowd that day, he was preaching Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Pentecost was just the beginning of the worldwide work of the gospel that continues to this day. Jesus was preached not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world to this very day. Paul himself was a huge part of this ministry to the Ephesians, and that was the reason he was writing to Timothy. Jesus is preached among the Gentiles to this very day through mission work, and we are blessed as a church to be part of missionary work around the world. It's wonderful that we can support missionaries in, in uh, Japan and in Portugal and in Haiti and in Mexico and locally in, uh, in uh, uh, Alaska and so on and so forth. And we are, we are part of that. I'm so thankful that we are as a church helping to spread the mystery of godliness to the Gentiles. Jesus has preached among the Gentiles through the missionaries today. The gospel is going to the nations as the good news of Jesus Christ is proclaimed to every tribe, every people, and every language. Wherever Jesus is proclaimed, he is believed on in the world. The next thing says, the first to believe were the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. John believed even before he saw the risen Christ. When he heard the, temp temp the, temp the tomb was empty, or almost empty, John 20 says, he did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen cloths lying, yet went he not in. As soon as he stood in the doorway, trying to figure out things, what does all of this mean? He saw the burial clothes still intact, but finally when he went inside where he saw and believed, chapter 20 and verse 8 says, on the evidence, just the evidence of burial clothes, he saw and believed that Jesus was risen from the dead. Later on, Mary Magdalene believed, saying that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Eventually, even doubting Thomas believed in spite of his initial doubts. As soon as the apostles began to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, others believed as well. Nearly 3,000 people believed on the day of Pentecost, according to Acts 2.41. Those believers told their sphere of influence, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. In my mind, it's doubtful that there is a single day that goes by without someone coming to Jesus Christ in faith. There are revivals happening around the world. I heard from a very reliable source that in Iran, when you think of Iran, you think of crazy, man maniacal Muslims, that 40% of the mosques are being shut down because nobody's going there anymore because they're believing in Christ. We know people are being saved in South America. We know people are being saved in China. People are being saved. And while we may not see a lot of true salvations here in Titusville or even in America, he is being believed on in the world today. This is a statement because God is still saving people. And he will continue to bring men and women and children to salvation until the last elect person is saved in this world and the world comes to an end with his second coming. 
Now, if anyone's listening to this sermon today and you trust Jesus for your salvation, then this verse is about you. You are the one who believed on in the world today. You're in the world, you believed on him, and therefore your faith is one proof that Jesus is believed on in the world. Now, one problem of taking this hymn in chronological order is this last phrase. He was received up into glory. This line, of course, refers to the ascension. In fact, the same verb, alolambano, is used in the book of Acts to describe the way Jesus ascended into heaven. After he appeared to the disciples, Acts 1.9 says, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. The problem is that this seems out of order. Jesus was received up into glory before he was preached to the Gentiles. Now, one possible solution is that this last phrase refers to his second coming. When Jesus returns to earth, he will come in the way he left, trailing clouds of glory to gather his people to himself. But the important thing in any case is that Jesus has become the glorified Christ. Glory, doxa, is the word that the Bible uses to describe the brightness, the splendor, and the radiance of Jesus Christ. Because of the resurrection, Jesus is now exalted. He is enthroned as he radiates the glory of God in his body. What a great way to end this hymn. Jesus came in the flesh. He suffered in the flesh. He rose again. He went up into heaven in the same body. He sat down gloriously at the right hand of the Father. And he's coming again in that same body and glory to judge the quick and the dead. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. The truth that the church holds out to the world today is the mystery of godliness. The mystery is that of the incarnation. Jesus manifest in the flesh. His resurrection. He was justified. He was proven in the spirit. He was presented. He was seen of angels. His mission. He was preached unto the Gentiles. He was received. He was believed on in the world. And he was glorified. Received up into glory. In other words, this hymn promotes the worship of God and encourages the preaching of the truth. John Chrysostom, one of the early church fathers, truly understood that the mystery of Christ is for godliness. When he preached this mystery at the church in Constantinople thousands of years ago, he made a very practical application. He said, God Indeed, or, or great indeed was it. For God became man, and man became God. A man was seen without sin. A man was received up. He was preached in the world. Together with us, the angels saw him. This indeed is a mystery, but let us live in a manner worthy of this mystery. This is good pastoral counsel. The truth about Jesus demands a response. What does it mean to live worthily of this mystery of godliness? Since Jesus was manifested in the flesh, let us glorify him with our bodies. Let's use our hands to help, our mouths to bless, our minds to serve. Since Jesus was justified in the spirit, let's pray that we ourselves will be justified on the day of judgment. Let's ask God to prove that we belong to him by giving us these glorious resurrected bodies. Since he was seen by angels, let's join the angels and the apostles in their worship of him around his throne. Since Jesus was preached to Gentiles, let's testify to his grace, declaring the gospel to everyone we love and sharing in the worldwide work of missions so that the nations might praise him. And since Jesus is believed on in the world, let's believe on him with all of our hearts for salvation as well as for everything else we need from him. 
And last of all, since Jesus was received up into glory, let's wait for his return with great anticipation, longing for the day when we will see the great mystery for ourselves. The only way you're going to have that longing is if you are one of those who have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a believer, you have that ingrained desire for Jesus to return. For you, when you die, to go meet him in heaven. That's part of being a believer. If you don't have that, you're an unbeliever. You have not yet believed on him in the world. And you need to. You need to. You do not want to die in your sins. You don't want to die as an unbeliever. What happens to unbelievers? They go into a place called hell when there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever and ever and ever. You will exist in darkness, rubbing shoulders with demons in everlasting pain, both physical and psychological, and it will never, ever, ever, ever end. What a horrible thing. What a horrible thing. But it's what you deserve by rejecting this gracious offer of salvation. God loved the world. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, sacrifice for sinners. Recognize that you are one of those sinners and repent and believe this good news that anyone who calls upon him shall be saved. Do not let a day go by. Do not let an hour go by as an unsaved person. There's too much at stake. Trust him. Believe in him. Turn to him for salvation. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you'll use this sermon in any way you see fit. I hope that it's blessed the believers here. I hope they leave here rejoicing that they're children of God. I hope they leave here understanding their responsibility to go into the world and preach to the Gentiles as the apostles did. I hope they go away from here thankful for all that you've done for them, being grateful, humbly grateful people. I hope that they go away from here knowing the importance of the truth, especially when so many churches have abandoned the truth for the sake of emotion, for the sake of building up their numbers or whatever. Help us to love the truth and proclaim the truth for your honor and for your glory. If there are lost people, don't let them leave unsaved. People listening over the internet, Please don't leave yourself in the state of unbelief. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Now we ask you, dear Holy Spirit, in our midst to work in a very powerful way to accomplish your sovereign purposes in our midst. In Christ's name, amen.